so I'd like to welcome each and every one of you this evening. And on behalf of the old Bristol Historical Society, I'd like to not only welcome you, but thank you all very much for coming to our third summer talk. And we're thrilled to have Wayne Riley delivering this special, special message. Before he gives it, however, I always have a little commercial. So I'd like to just simply say two things in particular. You pass by the rubber duckies out there. So on August 19th, we're having a rubber ducky race. Why? Not to just race duckies, but to raise money for Old Bristol Historical Society. So if you haven't bought a ducky, make sure you do before you leave. Secondly, if you're not a member of the Old Bristol Historical Society, we would love to have you join. We have, as Margaret said, what, 319 members at the present time. But we're always looking for more, and we would love to have you join our society. By joining, you get two free issues of our annual or biannual actual newsletter and get informed about all of our work. Most especially, you're just helping support the Old Bristol Historical Society to rebuild the mill, to establish the actual Bristol History Center, and to create our lovely new grounds and park there at the Pemmican River. So we'd love to have you as new members. So, that's our preamble. Now I'd like to introduce Wayne White. <coughs> Wayne uh, is an old friend. Uh, we were at Bowdoin College together. But nevertheless, uh, Wayne grew up, although he's a Riley here from town, his father was one of the eight Riley sons. His father was known as Bones, but Everett, Everett was his formal name. In any event, Wayne grew up in Troy, New York. Spent most every summer here coming to New Harbor, living in the home of his uncle, Jim Riley. He graduated from Bowdoin College in 1967, went on then to the University of Missouri, where he studied his graduate work in journalism. He then worked often for his cousin, Reggie Riley, so Reggie is first cousin, and he worked for four summers at Reggie's store. And Reggie didn't even kick him out. So, <laughs> now he owns a summer cottage right here on Massasoit Drive with his sister, Roberta. So Wayne has written over 400 newspaper columns on, on Bangor history. He was the editor and a journalist for the Bangor Daily News. Not only did he write all these columns, 400 columns on Bangor history, but he's also written four books entitled Remembering Bangor, The Hidden History of Bangor from Lumbering Days to the Progressive Era, Remembering Bangor, the Queen City Before the Great Fire, and lastly, Sarah Jane Foster, teacher of the Freedmen, the diary and letters of a Mainer woman in the South after the Civil War. So would you join with me in giving a warm welcome to Wayne Uh, this is quite a crowd. <laughs> Surprised. Uh, so a little bit about the background of this talk. I, uh, I already gave this talk here about 15 years ago. Uh, some of you may have been here. Not, not here, up at the McKinley School. I wrote, I wrote one of my first columns I wrote for the newspaper was about the, uh, all the shipwrecks there were. There were shipwrecks about every week. It was an extraordinarily dangerous profession. And uh, I mentioned the, uh, in the particular year I was looking at, 1903, the George F. Edmonds and the Sadie and Lily uh, was one of the more notable ones. And somebody saw that, I forget whether it was Peter or uh, Shirley Gear, may have been Shirley Gear. And he gave me a ring and said, why don't you come down and talk to the, this new society we started in Bristol. And uh, I said, okay, uh, and then I spent two, three months researching it. And it was about 16, 17 years ago that I was here giving this, not here, but giving this talk. Uh, anyway, we went all over to do it. Uh, the, the, I'll just start off with the talk itself. The wreck of the Gloucester fisherman, George F. Edmonds, and the coastal schooner, Sadie and Lily, on a September morning in 1903, within 200 yards of each other, 
on Pemiquid Point, uh, it is safe to say, was the biggest local news event in this town in the 20th century. I heard my father, who was born four years afterwards, speak of the event many times, and also uh, he'd speak of Weston Curtis, the local fisherman who rescued two of the survivors of the uh, Sadie and Lily. Uh, he, he lived just up, up the road here. I'll talk about him later. Uh, in the summers, for many years as a boy, I lived in the house overlooking New Harbor, owned by my Uncle Jim Riley, who was married to, to Weston Curtis's daughter, Velma. For a period of time, Curtis's wife, Annie, who owned a house up the road, was there a great deal as well, occasionally with her sons visiting as well. I only wish now that I had known enough to ask these people a few questions because they're all gone today. And I didn't even realize that they had any connection to this until a few years ago. Uh, so I wrote this history column every, mo every Monday in the Bangor Daily News, hundreds of them. And I was asked to give this talk and I, and I wrote a column about the prevalence of shipwrecks in the early 20th century, focusing on 1903 and 1904. Uh, I mentioned the, the two wrecks. Back then, news of shipwrecks or missing or overdue ships appeared in the newspaper nearly every week. Often these concerned main ships or vessels within main crew, crew aboard. These events were so common that the newspapers put aside a special column at the end of the year chronicling them. The Bangor Daily News list printed at the beginning of 1904 contained a list of 18 such mishaps involving main vessels for the year 1903. And I, I don't believe it was, I believe it was far from complete because I'd found other wrecks that were not included on the list. Uh, small boats simply disappeared without any publicity. <clears throat> In fact, I had, a, I had a great uncle that went off to sail to around the world or something. He was never heard of, never heard of again, so I assume he was one of the victims. Uh, one of the most spectacular wrecks that year was the loss of the five-masted schooner Washington B. Thomas off Old Orchard Beach just two months after it had been launched. Thomaston, at 287 feet, it was the largest wooden ship ever wrecked on the main coast. The captain and his crew were all rescued, but the captain's wife, was injured by debris and drowned after a wave smashed through the cabin in which she had taken refuge. One of the most poignant losses that year was the wreck of the Portland schooner Margaret Ward when it was hit by a steamship off Galveston, Texas. The captain, captain's two children drowned after being, quote, literally torn from their mother's arms, unquote. Uh, one of the most mysterious disasters after that time occurred January of 1904, when the Rockland-based schooner GM Brainerd, loaded with paving stone, was found sitting upright on the bottom of the ocean off Milford, Connecticut. Its sails set, its top mast protruding several feet out of the water. The falls were out, the compass was gone, reported the newspaper. The ship's yawl boat was missing as well. This prompted speculation that the crew had escaped after the vessel was crushed by ice were struck by another boat, but as the days went by, it became clear the men had disappeared below the ocean waves. The most tragic shipping event in, of this period, however, was the, the wrecks of the two schooners, Edmonds and Sadie and Lily, on September 17th, 1903, right, right near here. Uh, to my knowledge, the combined events represent the biggest marine tragedy in Bristol history, and one of the biggest in Maine history. 15 men died, Eight of those were married, six had children, this <coughs> compounding the tragedy. When I was asked to give this talk, I assumed I could easily find a well-researched piece of two or two about the Edmonds and the Sadie and Lily and base my talk on it. Instead, I found that no such articles exist. Uh, there's a lot of smaller ones, a lot of snippets, a lot of gossip, a lot of con con conflicting information and there's probably some in here too. But no one had ever researched the events and written the book or the long article that they deserved. Uh, by the way, did number one picture up here yet? Uh, no. <laughs> okay, there we go. There we go. That's, what's, that's what you read in the morning or the afternoon. Uh, 
after it happened in the Portland, Portland Evening Express. Uh, okay, where are we? So, for two or three months, uh, I compiled as much information as I could myself, contacted or visited a dozen libraries and historical associations from the Pemaquid Point Fisherman's Museum to the Gloucester Public Library, Cape Ann Historical Association, National Archives Branch Office in Waltham, Mass, and the one in Washington, D.C., too. Uh, I read many old newspapers on microfilm, mainly at the University of Maine, and I have talked to several people whose ancestors were involved in the event, including the grandniece of Captain Willard G. Poole of the George F. Edmonds and the granddaughter of Captain Willard C. Harding of the uh, Sadie and Lily as well as a grandson of Weston Curtis, who happened to be my cousin, Lee Riley. Uh, all of these people uh, remarkably li lived, live, lived within a few miles of each other in Bristol and South Bristol. Uh, the two ladies, I'm not sure they're still with us. I'm not sure where they live. Maybe they're in this room, are they? Either any of you here? It's two. I know Lee's moved to Florida. So... Um, uh, this talk is a work in progress, therefore this talk is a work in progress. And I'm not sure I'll, I'll ever be the one to finish it. Uh, there are still libraries and historical societies to check and dozens of attics where potentially useful information lies in diaries and letters. Uh, you can find some at the Bristol, Public, the Bristol Library uh, as well as um, in other spots. So here's the story as I know it. The weather was odd enough in the early fall of 1903 to warrant this comment from the Bangor Daily News, quote, nobody will forget September 1903, right away. It has been the hottest, strangest, most uncomfortable, knock down and drag out sort of time that we have had for a good many years. It sounds a little bit like the summer. Um, it does happen, we have, have these events over and over again. Uh, the mercury has taken a fiendish, ugly sort of glee and giving itself to the 85 and 90 mark, hanging there like <clears throat> grim death in the meantime. Everybody has come back from the seashore. Schools have commenced. The coal has been bought, and the winter clothing has been shaken out at cedar chests and moth-proof coverings. We are all ready for some crisp fall, but we don't get it. Instead, we are treated to a perpetual and exasperating steam bath. Into this steam bath, the hurricane roared up the coast in the middle of the month. First mention of it in Maine papers that I noticed was on September 16th in the Portland Evening Express. Headline said, damage is great. Atlantic City swept by the hurricane from the Gulf. Wrecks buildings, 50 hotels and cottages up unroofed. Railroad pier destroyed, all telegraph wires down. The stories were Dateline, Philadelphia, and New York. The next morning, the Bangor Daily News carried a more complete account of the storm in the south. Many disasters on Delaware coast. Schooner Haiti A. Marsh with stone from Maine dashed to pieces. Captain and four crew drowned. Three barges and their crews lost. President Roosevelt on board the Sylph encountered a fierce gale, saw a tug towing a big schooner go down. The stories told how a hurricane headed up the coast had hit Delaware with almost volcanic force. Um, I won't mention here all the other vessels that were wrecked. There were a lot of them, or the men who died. I will mention Teddy Roosevelt's crews, with all his relatives and dignitaries aboard the presidential yacht from Oyster Bay to Ellis Island, uh, where they were diverted briefly to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Early that morning, of course, the Edmonds and the Sadie and Lily already had been wrecked on Pemaquid Point. And it was the lead story in the Portland Evening Express that afternoon, there it is. Uh, 15 lives lost, two vessels succumbed to last night's storm. Both captains perished. Main, main coaster and Gloucester schooner wrecked. Two men of each crew crushed, uh, saved by the heroic efforts of Weston Curtis. Uh, I'll describe what happened to each ship separately because there really is no connection between the two events other than the storm and their ultimate destinations on the rocks. Um, I see Captain, uh, two, two, two. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. It's supposed to be Captain Two, but never mind. Oh. I found it. Oh, okay. So I want to see that map later, too. 
<laughs> we'll get this straightened out. Do you want this one? Or? No, no, <laughs> it's all yours at this point. Uh, um, there, there's, there's Willard Poole from South Bristol. Um, moved, to, uh, moved to Gloucester where you went if you were, I won't say a real fisherman, but it's where the big time fisherman went. His brother lived there. He had brothers living around here too. And um, born in 1839, making him 64 years old at the time of his death. Poole followed the sea on square riggers from an early age. During the Civil War, his ship was captured by the Confederate raider Alabama. And while the rest of the crew was placed in irons, he was ordered to feed them, according to the book, The Shipping Days of Old Boothbane. Poole first turned up in the Gloucester Mass City Directory in 1865, listed as a fisherman. His brother Samuel also became a resident. He was one of the principal owners of the American Halibut Company, according to the Boston transcript. He owned a fleet of 14 or more fishing boats, according to Kathy Norwood, who I think I already mentioned, and she was uh, a relative. She was, uh, might have been uh, Poole's granddaughter. Um, <clears throat> by 1887, Willard was wealthy enough to have the George F. Edmonds built at nearby Essex, Massachusetts. Uh, he named it after Senator George Edmonds of Vermont, who was credited with helping the New England fishing industry. Boat was 95 feet long, 149 tons. Quote, the largest vessel hailing from this port, meaning Gloucester, said the Gloucester Daily Times. Poole and 15 men had been seining for mackerel for several weeks. They had not caught more than a barrel, decided to come home. The last boat to see them was another member of the Gloucester fleet, the, sch the schooner Alice M. Jacobs, which accompanied the Edmonds uh, down from Mount Desert Rock. Apparently, Jacobs was following the Edmonds because Jacobs captain didn't know the coastline <clears throat> as well as um, as uh, Poole did, um, until the two boats separated sometime after dark, and I read somewhere that that's because the Jacobs captain could hear, started to hear uh, waves pounding on the shore, and he thought, I better get off shore before anything happens. That night, the Jacobs weathered the storm off Portland. Nearly two months later, however, on December 15th, she sank off Newfoundland. Uh, the crew, however, was rescued. Uh, according to the official rec report filed with the U.S. government for the Edmonds, Poole was headed for Booth Bay and decided to put into John's Bay, with which he would have been very familiar, uh, after the storm hit around 11 p.m. He'd already been able to see Pemaquid Light, but then the storm, the hurricane came in, uh, the storm, whatever it was. Um, rec reports say, one of the crew, uh, okay, where are we? nor the storm hit around 11 p.m. The rec report says, one of the crew say, uh, saved, says Captain judged his vessel five miles from the light and was going to John's Bay. Clear, of t clear at time of passing light, rain and wind came up suddenly. The papers probably got it right, about right within a day or two of the wrecks when they summed up the situation this way. Both wrecks resulted from the sailing masters miscalculating their positions in the thick weather. Captain Poole thought he was making Booth Bay Harbor via Johns Bay, apparently, while Captain Harding believed his course was leading him into the Kennebec River, which was much, much further. Uh, Harding was on a smaller two-masted uh, two uh, schooner. <coughs> According to the survivors of the Edmonds, John C. Lewis of Provincetown and Edward Kerrigan Pemaquid light was spotted for the last time just before they struck the rocks. Lewis related to an insurance agent who in turn talked to a reporter that when they tried to haul offshore, quote, fate was against them as the foresail and jib were blown away and torn to ribbons and the vessel was rendered helpless and soon driven into the rocks. Uh, the survivor Kerrigan told the reporter that Captain Poole had just given orders to double reef that mainsail at about 1 a.m. when they struck the rocks with a tremendous crash, throwing them into the deck. 
and rendering the condition of the ship hopeless. Can we see number three? Okay, this, this, that's okay. Uh, they're, both, they're, both, they're both the same. I mean, they're okay. There, there you can see where the Edwards were. There's, there's Kresge's Point. There's Pemaquid Light. That's where the Edmonds ended up. As a, I'll, I got a picture of that later, I think. And uh, you go around the corner, and that's where the um, Harding went into the Sadie and Lily went, in, went into the rocks just above that little uh, indentation, a little cove uh, where people park down there in Cressy's Point. And if you, if you look at the pictures closely, I think you can still see where the Sadie and Lily was up in the air the next morning, uh, on, on, held on the rocks. When did they both hit at the same time? Or no, they're about other? two hours difference, as I recall, reading somewhere. Um, they weren't with each other. They weren't with each other. <clears throat> That's my understanding. Okay. Um, the Edmonds was stranded on the rocks about 100 rods west of the lighthouse, according to the wreck report. Other accounts place it in front of the house that was occupied a few years back by the Howard sisters. Everybody remember the Howard sisters? It's an unusual house with a, a clabberds over bricks. And if you, if you walk around it, I don't, I don't know who lives there now, but I've been trespassing on your, on your land. You walk around it and you can see these kind of flat rocks that I'll show a little later where the, Ed, uh, the Edmonds went right ashore. Um, <clears throat> okay. A rod is five and a half yards and a, and a hundred is about a third of a mile. And I drove this distance in my car along the loop road and that's, that was about right. It's rather flat there without large ledges. Um, hmm. yeah, can we get number four? No, uh oh. No, no, that's no. Uh -oh. Ah, there you go. No, backwards, backwards. There you go. This is uh, this is the rocks where I believe the Edmonds went went ashore. And you can see the point, the lighthouse up there, and the the ship was smashed to pieces. And I've got a picture of what I think is the ship a little later, and you can you can see there's almost nothing left of it. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> I can keep track of this. I drew, okay, um, the men on board. Okay, the men on board the vessel, Edmonds, put up a heroic struggle to survive. Kerrigan told the Gloucester Daily Times, some of the crew pulled up the seine boat, which was towing behind by a, a painter, and four of the crew got into the boat when it broke loose and drifted off. Um, Quote, we then started to launch the dory, which was accomplished after much difficulty as the tackles were gone. And it was necessary to lift the dory over the side into the sea. Now, dories are heavy. And there were, I think there were only five men that were left over to do this. Once this was accomplished, both, both the same boat and the dory capsized. Kerrigan and Lewis, who were both aboard the dory, were the only occupants lucky enough to get washed up on the rocks where they could crawl out of harm's way. Captain Poole never left the boat. <clears throat> Lewis was washed up onto the rocks on the, on the hands and knees, crawled up the slope. He recalled two strong hands grasping his boot and he pulled, away, he pulled being pulled away in the backwash of the surf. And he stumbled into a tree that had been stripped of its bark and he mistook that for a house. This is all very hard to picture, but he wandered across a field, he's headed headed to the west, I guess. He wandered across a field and came to a house where he told his story. Is that Weston Curtis? I don't know. The other survivor, Kerrigan, went in the opposite direction, found himself in the Pemaquid Hotel. Both men thought they were the sole survivors, according to the newspapers. And this is an emotional scene where they finally come together and meet each other and realize they're the only two survivors. Um, of the boat. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> what are we listening to here? <laughs> uh, okay. 
Lewis died a year or two later when he froze to death in a dory off Cape Cod. Uh, Kerrigan, I have no idea what happened to him. Uh, the Sadie and Lily. Okay, let's go to um, six. Sadie and Lily. Two names, two women's names. Cannot play. Six, it should be six. I don't even know what I want anymore. Okay, that's, yeah, that's one. Um, I was look, trying to get Captain Harding first, number six. I think he's uh, got a lot of uh, character there, too. Uh, he was captain of uh, Sadie and Lily. Um, she was built in Stuban in 1884. She was 64 feet long, 56 tons. For a number of years, the vessel was owned by a group of people, most of whom lived in Washington County. At some point, however, she was apparently purchased by Captain Harding, part of a seafaring family from Prospect Ferry, a village in, on the Penobscot River in the town of Prospect across the river from Bucksport. Harding was 53 years old at the time of the wreck, which might explain why his wife had been opposed to his purchasing the boat. He was getting towards the end of, end of things. Uh, a family story related to me by his granddaughter, Joe Voss, who lived in Chamberlain and has donated, well, never mind that. Uh, the, uh, anyways, so anyway, he bought it anyway, and that's what happened to him. Sadie and Lily were bound from Prospect to Boston in ballast, meaning they had no, no cargo. And she was a type, she looks like a, a lumber ship to me. The type they, they used to go up into Bangor and made Bangor the lumber capital of the world for a while with tons of lumber. Uh, she was, Thrown up on the west bank of Kresge's Point, less than 200 yards away from the Edmonds, which was on the east side. Like Captain Poole, Captain Harding had miscalculated his position, thinking he was going to the Kennebec River, which is way off. I wrote somewhere it was 40 miles from Pemaquip, that seemed like too far. Um, I have been unable to find any interviews with the two men who survived the wreck. Meanwhile, Weston Curtis, our hero, lived on what is called Meadow Lane today, or what is called, was called Meadow Lane. I assume that's the Meadow Lane that's along Route 130. It's just up from uh, Massasoit Drive where I live. And I, th and I think if you, it says private, so I'm, I have not ventured in. But I think if you go in there, you're gonna come to uh, what was called Fish House Cove, which is where the coves were. You can still see on old postcards. And that would have been where Weston kept his fishing gear. But I have speculation. I've never been down Meadow Lane. Uh, he was alerted that there was a wreck, and he headed out in the storm with a rescue line, unaware that there were really two wrecks. He followed the smell of kerosene, according to his grandson, Lee, uh, his grand, um, and arrived at the wreck of the Sadie and Lily, where he thought that was the main wreck, but it wasn't. He threw a line to the vessel, Two of the men were able to use it to get to dry ground, but Captain Harding became entangled, engulfed in the surf, and drowned. Unlike the, uh, the um, Edmonds, the Sadie and Lily was sitting upright, perched on dry ground the next morning. That's why there's some good pictures of it. Uh, the next morning, um, When a second, apparently that night, a second storm arrived and destroyed it. Yeah, there it is, Sadie and Lily. Uh, and if you, could, if you could down there, I think I figured out where it was, if you could down there. But I went back again this summer, and I wasn't so sure anymore. The, the rocks had changed a bit, um, I think. Anyway, that's it. Um, it's the ship. Um, Okay, obviously if those two, men, those two men, those three men had waited till morning, they could have got off the ship and walked to shore on the rocks and they wouldn't have been in trouble. But Weston wanted to rescue them. Okay. 
In Gloucester, the news of the wreck of the Edmonds was greeted with shock and mourning. Captain Poole's son, also named Willard, a local businessman, received the news by phone from his uncle in Booth Bay, Uncle Eben. He came to Pemaquid Point as witnessed by his name and that of Uncle Eben in the hotel ledger, which with the hotel ledger was just sitting over there behind the counter. Uh, I'd like to think it's still there, but maybe not. And you, can, you can see all the people that came as a result of these wrecks came from all over. Um, of course, the Hotel Pemaquid had a lot of people from away who were there to look at, look at property that they might want to buy. <clears throat> uh, it is a sad and curious coincidence that the point where the vessel was lost is but a short way, almost in sight of where Captain Poole was born 64 years ago. That's Gloucester Daily Times again. Besides the strange coincidence of the wreck location so close to Poole's boyhood home, the newsmen of the day spotted other mysterious happenings. For example, Poole, a member of the local Red Men's Lodge, <clears throat> had paid his dues early, just before the voyage, telling the recipient, I will leave this with you as I may not be home in time. Or at all. Captain Poole was one of the oldest, as well as the most respected, and so forth. Quiet, none ostentations. Um, this was to be his last voyage another captain having been obtained to take over the boat, his son told the Boston Journal. News of shipwrecks was nothing new in Gloucester, as I think I already said. Uh, the paper pointed out that this was the saddest news the community received since May. In other words, they'd received more sad news just a few months ago, when it was learned of the sinking of the Gloriana off Nova Scotia, loss of a captain and 14 men. In actuality, this was not the worst sinking caused by this particular hurricane, because the steamer Mexicano had found it off the coast of Florida with a loss of 21 men. Uh, okay, we have um, the Republican Journal, Belfast Republican Journal published a tribute to the Hardings, uh, F.E. Harding. Uh, the year after his brother, F.E. Harding, was lost in a similar manner off Long Island in the Barge Bell of Oregon. The Harding brothers were married to sisters. I, both, so both the Harding brothers died that year. They were married to sisters, compounding the tragedy. And a week, a week later, the paper reported, quote, Mrs. W.C. Harding is quite ill. Uh, I've been unable to track down anything about the two survivors from the, um, uh, the Edmund, no, Sadie and Lily. Uh, Abbott of Verona and Eugene Aldous of Belfast. No, from, uh, those are from the uh, Sadie and Lewis, Sadie and Lily. Well, I believe they are pictured in a poor quality photocopy I received from the Maine Maritime Academy. Same photograph is reproduced in a book on Maine shipwrecks by William P. Quinn, which you may have seen. Um, and it was a, supposed to be a little item on the Willis and Guy, the uh, coal ship that was sunk eight or 10 years later, gave cold to everybody in Bristol that winter. Uh, but the, the, these two men, I believe, were the survivors of the, um, of the other ship. And I think they think they had it mixed up. Many people in Bristol confused the two wrecks I've discovered. Uh, schooner Willis and Guy was full of coal, wrecked in 1917. Uh, Many of my ancestors got their coal for that winter, probably some of yours too. Um, curiosity seekers came from as far as 20 miles away to see the wrecks. Most of the bodies from the Edmund were found within a, a few days. Rescue workers wielding long poles with hooks on the end stood on the shore the first day and watched some of the bodies tossed about in the surf, but the waves were too high to retrieve them. The rescue workers also used the, bo the bo hooks to grasp onto rocks higher up in the shore to save themselves when the surf came in, sometimes up to their necks. The drowned men hearkened from all over, from, from up and down the coast, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland to Maine to Cape Cod. They also came from the Azores, Norway, Sweden. Gloucester was truly an international fishing capital back then. Two of them, Peter Merchant and Lewis Perry, both bachelors from Nova Scotia, were reported by the newspapers to have been buried in New Harbor, 
but I've been able to find no evidence of that. Um, maybe, maybe someone knows where they're buried. But I, there were graves buried too, but nobody seems to know where they are. Um, indeed, the town paid S.M. Blazel six dollars to dig two graves in connection with the shipwrecks, according to the town report in 1904. So I suspect this is true, although perhaps the bodies were removed later, or possibly they were taken back to Gloucester. The two survivors from the Edmonds, or from wherever Edmonds, stayed around for a day or two to help out. Oh, the two survivors from the Edmonds stayed around for a day or two to help identify the bodies, although at least one, and perhaps both of them, refused to enter the cottage established as the morgue, preferring to wait outside and identify the corpses based on their clothes or body marks or what was in their pockets. Oddly enough, I found this bit of information in a poem. The Ballad of Pemiquid Point, published in 1941 by um, Melville Arthur Schaefer, a minister and a former resident. I have no reason to believe it. it's any different than uh, any of the other information I've got here. Uh, does anybody know the cottage, which was the morgue? The morgue. I, tr I tried to find that place, uh, and I think I finally narrowed it down to two cottages, houses, next to the long lawn, next to where the neater fingers live or used to live. And I went to one of them one night, and I knocked on the door and, and told her about the shipwreck. She said, I don't know anything about that. And I said, well, this, was, this may have been the morgue. The more. <laughs> Well, that was sort of the end of the conversation. <laughs> and, uh, and I noticed somebody has torn that cottage down, I believe, and built a bigger one there. So they may have had enough hearing about the morgue, but whatever, I don't know, whatever. Edith Harry, the famous librarian, thought it was one of those two cottages, but she wasn't sure which. So, uh, okay, most of the bodies were found within a day or two except Pools and one or two others. His son had offered an, a reward. The newspapers reported at the end of March that Captain Pools' body was discovered on Eastern Egg, Egg Rock, and I've heard Haddock Island elsewhere, by Levi Elwell of Muscongas Island. Uh, the popular version is that it was frozen in a block of ice. And uh, I have no reason to believe that's not true. The rest of the story is mainly about money the undertakers from Gloucester showed up and there was a squabble with the local undertakers over the disposition of the bodies because there was money involved in each body you could get control of. Uh, and quote, the, dis, the undertaker from Gloucester had, a stern, had to make a stern fight in order to bring the bodies home, responded the Gloucester Daily Times. Not having gotten word from Gloucester to hold the bodies, the main undertakers were all set to bury more of the fishermen in order to collect the $35 that the state promised for each burial, claimed, claimed the newspaper. Furthermore, the bodies had not been embalmed because the local undertakers were not embalmers. In any event, apparently only Merchant and Lewis ended up buried here, and I'm not even sure of that. So, whatever. As you can see, this is not a particularly thrilling story. Someone said this was a thrilling story. This is a, a horrific story. And, uh, so it sort of gives me nightmares to think about all this. Town report from 1904 lists total town expenses of $407, including $25 to George M. Elliott for the rent of a cottage for the undertakers. And I guess that was a place for them to stay. And $283 for undertaker bill to Charles Russell and E.S. Elliott apparently in town. The town also paid R.H. Orham, chairman of the board of selectmen, a total of $59 for eight days of labor looking for bodies and a journey to Gloucester for unspecified reasons. Town of Gloucester repaid $200 of the money and one of the deceased, Manuel Lopez, the Azores, had, happened to have insurance, amazingly, $39.25. The Edmonds had some insurance, $7,000. I don't know if, uh, if, uh, if the city and Lily was insured or not. R.H. Orham uh, 
the wife, uh, he, he sent her some, some money. And I got a letter, I was given a letter from him to uh, Harding's wife, um, which uh, has said, um, his final words of solace to Mrs. Harding were that his own, his own father had died in a shipwreck, Port-au-Prince, when he was just a boy. And searchers were still looking for Captain Poole's body and quote, at least you had the satisfaction of seeing your husband's body and laying it away, which privilege has been denied to Mrs. Poole. So I don't, I don't know how, the, how, how that made her feel, but anyway. <laughs> I will conclude by reading a few lines, very few lines from Mr. Schaefer's interesting poem, Ballad of Pemberwood Point. He says, ah well for those on land, lucky people on land, to watch friends walk the deep, inciting all the sorcery of the sea, to make a spectacle grand. But for the men in ships, ah, God, what plight they know. And that was the end of it. And there's other tales um, that I haven't gotten to the bottom of. And I won't go any further. If anybody knows Billy Sawyer, I'd be interested in talking to him afterward. <laughs> no Billy Sawyers here? No. Okay. That's about it. Thank you for coming. That's a postcard. That is a color postcard, yeah. yeah. And there's nothing of the Edmonds left. Oh, wait, now there is a there is a picture. Have you got that? You've got that somewhere. I want I wanted to show that. That's kind of an important kind of an important picture. It's just a framework. Oh, here it is right here. Okay, let me show you. Number four, number five, it's marked. Right there. I don't think it's in here. Oh dear. Well, it shows, it shows nothing but the frame of a, of a boat with, with several men standing on it. And there's Pemiquid Point over there, and I'm pretty certain that's the Edmonds and all that was left of it. So. Laying aside from Shirley Gear, were there any others that you know of that saw those actual wrecks? Saw them? Saw the actual wreck. Yeah, I don't think Shirley Gear did. He he called me up and, and he'd seen this line I wrote in one, in a column. Yeah. yeah. The only other person I remember who was at that meeting I think was Phil Abra. Seeing here tonight. Wayne, thank you very much. Thank you.